Hi everyone, I'm Manu Duman. I work at Central European University specializing in labor economics and uh, social policy and uh, currently I am uh, doing research at International Labor uh, Organization. In the first part of this seminar, I will briefly discuss uh, the precarious employment, what it means, uh, what are some of the consequences, and particularly its implication for uh, female workers. And in the second part of the uh, seminar, I would like to focus more on the situation in Turkey and mention some of the findings, both qualitative and quantitative, uh, how precarious employment is affecting the women who are uh, working in very different positions and uh, coming from very different uh, backgrounds. Uh, but before I start the first part of the lecture, I would like to uh, thank Pınar Dinc and uh, all the others who are involved uh, in Turkey Beyond Borders uh, project for giving me this uh, opportunity. It is great that uh, I get the chance uh, to present uh, some of my research and uh, talk a little bit about uh, sometimes uh, ignored aspect of precarious employment in uh, developing country context. Uh, so <clears throat> what uh, I will start or uh, what I would like to first go over is what makes a job precarious? And uh, I'm sure everyone has an opinion, has an idea about when we say precari precariousness, uh, something else comes to their uh, mind, and this is very much also visible uh, in the literature, uh, since there is no uh, agreement between the authors, between the researchers who are doing uh, work on uh, precarious employment, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, it is a very wide-ranging topic, uh, going from uh, temporary employment or involuntary part-time employment to informal, uh, to solo uh, self of employment uh, or any type of gig platform work that we increasingly see in developed as well as in uh, developing uh, countries. So the idea here is that precarious jobs, precarious employment, uh, despite lacking a legal definition, involves all the occupations, all the positions in the labor market uh, that are paying uh, very low wages uh, and in that sense making the workers financially economically uh, vulnerable that have high insecurities for example in the case of temporary employment it is not clear whether the workers can have a contract or uh, the duration of the job that they are doing and there is no uh, legal or <coughs> de facto guarantee that they will be employed in the consecutive uh, periods, but also social protection, uh, particularly when it comes to informal sector workers, but also what we see in developed countries is the gray area, the uh, lack of legal definition of who is an employee, uh, and therefore for platform workers, for gig workers also, uh, many of the fringe benefits like pensions, uh, paid sick leave, uh, maternity leave, etc. This kind of uh, benefits are not accruing, uh, whether they are in the formal or uh, in the uh, informal sector. So the idea here is uh, that the uh, precarity is multidimensional uh, and depending on the uh, society and the economy, the most salient factor uh, that makes a job precarious might change, but on the overall uh, uh, these positions, these uh, occupations uh, uh, are the ones that pay low wages, usually like social protection, um, that uh, they are insecure and as a result, uh, as expected, have many uh, negative uh, consequences for the workers. And one of the issues is that uh, it is not a new or novel uh, development in labor markets. We have been seeing precarity uh, uh, since the 1980s especially, uh, but particularly uh, with the globalization and the neoliberal policies and deregulation of the uh, labor markets. And the idea uh, or what is uh, very peculiar about the precariousness in the current context is that it is becoming very normalized. And unlike uh, many authors or many researchers who strongly associate precarity with low wage and low quote unquote prestige uh, vocations, it can be 
uh, it actually appears in all sectors and all uh, activities. Just to give you one very stark example, uh, in academia, people with PhDs are also working under very precarious uh, conditions. For example, in the United States, there are some uh, figures which claim that 70% of the all econ uh, teaching is done by the uh, uh, adjunct professors, and uh, adjunct professors have temporary contracts. They're only paid for uh, nine months uh, instead of 12 months. So you can imagine uh, the, the uh, low wage and the low benefit trap that they are <coughs> living uh, under. And uh, last month, uh, indeed, uh, uh, there was a UCLA job advertisement, which uh, in a way illustrated how normalized precarious employment become uh, uh, such a prestigious and high standard university in the chemistry and biochemistry department. Uh, basically, the job advertisement was seeking for someone who has a PhD and experience in the field and yet uh, was willing to work without any type of compensation, including wages or uh, social security benefits. And obviously, this created a lot of um, <coughs> Uh, public voice uh, and disgruntlement, uh, but the, 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 the worrying part is the uh, response that the UCLA uh, posted later on uh, once again made it very clear that the precariousness in the labor market is something that the employers are very much acknowledging and expecting and uh, suggesting that this is the new uh, normal. So one problem with precarious employment is obviously it brings a lot of disadvantages to the workers who are employed in such jobs. But the second problem is that it is becoming the new normal and uh, uh, the standard or the protected and the secure jobs are uh, harder uh, to see. And uh, one of the reasons why, as I mentioned, it is rising both in the developed and the developing countries is globalization and particularly export-led growth uh, and the type of the competition globalization brought because in the name of competitiveness, a lot of countries deregulated their labor markets, uh, started to implement policies uh, that were very much uh, encouraging, uh, if not forcing, to lower down the wages and uh, generate national competitiveness uh, or productive capabilities uh, on this uh, basis. And a corollary of the globalization, uh, along with the political developments, of course, is the neoliberal policies and the retrenchment of the social uh, protection action especially in developed countries, but also in some developing countries, uh, particularly uh, with the decline, with the uh, demise of collective representation uh, of uh, labor. So not only the benefits were cut uh, in uh, developed and developing countries alike, uh, but also uh, many laws and regulations that are pro-business, that are favoring the employers at the expense of the workers have been passed, for example, uh, lifting up the employment protection uh, legislation, making the dismissals much more easier, or um, relaxing the conditions to hire uh, temporary workers. Uh, and in the case of the developing countries, uh, coupled with globalization and the political pressures, many of the informal workers remain to be informal because most of the multinationals uh, continue to outsource and subcontract their um, production. Uh, and there were no regulations or there were no penalties using uh, uh, informal sector workers uh, and not offering these people uh, standard contracts or social security uh, benefits. Efforts. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is also the period where the trade unions and collective bargaining uh, was on, were on a decline, and this altered the uh, uh, employer's uh, power, uh, and the power relations were very much tilted towards the employers, uh, and they were, they were able to exploit the ample, ample labor supply in the uh, global south, which basically meant that the risks for example, unemployment or not having pensions uh, or not having uh, employment security, this kind of risks and insurance against them, the responsibility to shield workers from these kind of vagaries were very much shifted from the <clears throat> 
state and the employers uh, to the shoulders of the uh, workers. And finally, which uh, many economists uh, like to talk about is the growth of the service sector because uh, by nature and by character, service sector is very different than the manual and the industrial jobs. Uh, for example, many of the service uh, jobs uh, are uh, heavily demand dependent and uh, the, these services uh, are used when there is call uh, from the clients, uh, which means that they usually have more erratic schedules, uh, more unpredictable working hours. Secondly, unlike factories, unlike industrial labor, most of the service sector workers are scattered uh, and they are not necessarily working in the same <clears throat> place, physical place, which makes uh, organization and collective association uh, much more difficult. So the service growth of the service sector, uh, and not only in developed countries, but also in developing countries, is yet another reason why the precarious employment became the dominant type and, uh, in a way, pushed a lot of pressure to uh, remove or uh, to get rid of the standard contracts because for employers, the uh, non-standard or more flexible types of work is obviously more profitable in the uh, service sector. Uh, so <clears throat> what kind of implications or outcomes these different types of precarious employment have. And in a second, I will also mention why these consequences might matter for women uh, more, women in uh, general. And then in the second part, I will go into the detail of the uh, Turkish case. And obviously, the uh, the uh, precarious employment has uh, many shortcomings, many disadvantages. Uh, for all groups, including men, women, uh, prime working age people, uh, young, younger or uh, elderly that are uh, in, this, uh, in these uh, positions. But the idea uh, for them, or at least the political discourse uh, that were that was supportive for uh, generating more flexibility in the labor market basically had women and particular groups in mind when these regulations and the laws were uh, passing uh, or this is how they were marketed to the uh, overall society and the claim was that because women uh, assume most of the care responsibilities in every country, they need to reconcile work and life. So for them, having more flexible schedules like part-time employment or having a less rigid contractual arrangement, like in the case of temporary employment, or even uh, more flexibility in the form of informality can bring a lot of uh, benefits. Uh, for example, they can uh, arrange their working time uh, accordingly and then juggle unpaid household work with the <coughs> labor market uh, activities. But uh, the problem is that actually in many countries and uh, almost all empirical research have shown us that, uh, including women, uh, no one is uh, really benefiting from uh, precarious uh, employment, uh, neither the informal or the uh, temporary or the involuntary part-time uh, <coughs> Forms. And uh, there are many reasons for that. So, for example, in the case of temporary work, it has been found that the job insecurity is uh, too high and uh, the, the, these kind of positions, in a way, impede the uh, career advancement, particularly for women, because women also have to leave the uh, labor force, uh, especially in developing countries where there is no maternity leave or uh, where there are uh, policies on only covering a very small section of the uh, labor force, uh, the workforce. They also miss uh, a lot of social security benefits, even if they are legally covered. So in the case of temporary or part-time employment, for example, there is no distinction between uh, the part-time and the full-time employees in terms of uh, getting pensions, uh, sick leave, maternity leave. But the problem is, uh, particularly for the contributory schemes like pensions, unemployment insurance, et cetera, uh, the part-time workers or temporary 
healthcare workers do not have the necessary uh, amount premiums or the time uh, to, in the end, earn a decent pension or uh, 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 use these kind of <clears throat> fringe benefits, uh, this kind of non-material compensation. Uh, and uh, for informal workers, for obvious reasons, in many countries, there is hardly any chance unless these people personally pay their premiums and given the very low wages, it is very, very difficult for any informal or at least for low wage informal workers to chip into social security registration, even if there are legal uh, uh, possibilities and the procedures. For example, in Turkey, you can personally pay into social security, uh, uh, but the, the premiums are quite high, especially for people who are making very little uh, in the labor market. Uh, and other kind of uh, Disadvantages that we see uh, both theoretically but also empirically are uh, clearly some mental and physical health problems due to the stress, the uh, heavy burden and insecurity these people are carrying. Uh, for example, there are many studies showing that the uh, people who have short term contracts or job insecurity are always worried about uh, the duration of their employment, which puts a lot of uh, burden and stress on their work as well as uh, personal lives. Uh, and you can imagine training opportunities are very limited, uh, and uh, which means that actually these people have very little chances, if at all, for transitioning into higher quality uh, jobs. So one problem with precariousness is that if you start your career, if you start your work life as a precarious worker, it is much more likely that you will lag behind uh, and continue your uh, work life uh, in less secure positions or in less uh, privileged positions for the rest of the uh, history. Uh, and finally, collective bargaining and unionization is very meager if it exists. And we see some revitalization and some uh, attempts on the side of the worker organizations to include precarious workers, but still these are at uh, infancy and the problem is multiple. On the one hand, for precarious workers, there are very few resources in terms of time, energy that they can allocate to collective representation. So for these people, actually the work schedules are very long uh, and Therefore, it is uh, it, the time is very scarce to go on and uh, organize, even if they have very acute issues uh, at the workplace. And the second problem is that traditionally, uh, many worker organizations, including trade unions, are um, in a way uh, um, undertaking or following pursuing the interest of their insiders, they are already members, rather than the people who are working in the informal sector or who have uh, temporary work uh, arrangements. And uh, this is very, very clear, very, very obvious from the informal sector because even in countries where informal sector employment is actually uh, the <clears throat> dominant one, in the labor markets, we don't see much of collective uh, organization or collect or freedom of association or any type of representation uh, of these workers. So you can see that despite some of the uh, discourse uh, that had been used to promote uh, precarious employment uh, and selling it in the name of flexibility, uh, many of the studies, uh, actually majority of the studies in the literature literature show that the precarious workers, people in this type of work conditions, uh, work arrangements, have uh, suffered both from low wages, no social security, no representation, no training. And uh, what I would like to now uh, uh, to go over a little bit is uh, why it is much worse for women. And here the idea is simple, especially in countries like Turkey, where there are very rigid gender roles. By the way, the rigid gender roles also are uh, seen everywhere. So it is nothing peculiar about the cultural or the sociopolitical uh, background, but obviously the degree of this discrimination and segregation that we see in countries like Turkey is uh, 
uh, much higher. Uh, and the idea here is that as a result of these very rigid gender roles, which are hard to <clears throat> change and they very slowly evolve, gradually evolve over time, the intersection of gender with precariousness brings about uh, even more disadvantages. And I'm going to uh, mention a few of them. So for example, the idea of flexibility in the labor markets, as I mentioned, emerged uh, with the claim, with the proposition that women will benefit from it because they already have unpaid care responsibilities and they need to reconcile work and life, therefore for them flexible arrangements could be a better option and they can select these type of jobs. But the problem is even if women voluntarily select, opt for these kind of jobs, these jobs are usually low paid and uh, uh, lie at the uh, bottom of the career ladder, which means that uh, for the society or that the perceptions of the society are reproduced and the women's labor uh, continue to be undervalued. Uh, so one of the problems is, is that uh, the, the reproduction of the rigid gender roles and the patriarchal relations through temporary and informal or any any other type of the precarious employment because women choose these jobs to juggle uh, their paid and unpaired uh, activities. But of course, uh, this also means that women are very much locked into these kind of uh, positions. Uh, the second problem is that uh, actually, uh, if you look at the empirical literature, many of the women who are working in precarious uh, jobs uh, in these positions are not doing it voluntarily. So this discursive uh, and this claim, theoretical claim that flexibility will bring uh, uh, joy and uh, more uh, better working conditions or reconciliation of life and work is in fact not true or empirically not verified because most of the women who have been surveyed or we have data on uh, very openly explicitly stated that they are in these positions they are working in these jobs because they are forced to in the sense that they have no other uh, viable option unlike men uh, because uh, at least for the temporary contracts, not so much for informal employment. Uh, the men uh, reported that they do it for uh, education or uh, other kind of opportunities, other kind of uh, <coughs> reasons that might advance uh, their career. So you can see that there are first of all, there are differences. Uh, it is very distinct why a woman might be in a precarious employment versus why a man uh, might be in. Uh, and this doesn't, of course, mean that the precarious employment do not have um, disadvantages or uh, uh, worsen the working conditions for men, but gender intersecting with the precarious employment has more dire consequences or uh, implications. Uh, and as I said, the unpaid, the coupling of the unpaid and the paid work for women is especially uh, very problematic in some countries. So if you look at the OECD, where we have uh, time use survey data that is standardized, you can see that in every country developing or developed, women actually uh, uh, allocate uh, much higher time to unpaid household responsibilities, including childcare and uh, elderly care. But especially in some countries, this is the ratio or the difference between men and women is so stark. So if you look at India, for example, women uh, uh, spend almost seven times more time in unpaid work uh, than uh, men. And this ratio is around 4.5 times in Turkey, which is the third highest country in the OECD uh, survey. So the, the issue here is that in such settings where we have societies where the gender roles are very rigid and very straightforward, uh, we 
see problems with uh, women being in precarious employment because this doesn't necessarily bring them any kind of uh, improvement in their uh, uh, household responsibility or reconcil reconciliation of work and life. Quite the contrary, it uh, actually adds up to the reproduction uh, of these gender biased, uh, uh, gender, uh, gender division of uh, labor. So the, one of the problems is that uh, the, the precarious employment where women are disproportionately uh, uh, represented, uh, where they have a higher share, first of all, uh, in societies, particularly where we have gender division of labor, uh, maintains or reinforces this kind of uh, division of uh, labor. The second problem is uh, coming from the discrimination in the labor market, because once women are uh, employed in this kind of positions, in this kind of jobs, this can generate uh, or this can fuel the beliefs about the uh, low value of the female work. Uh, and uh, instead of looking at, for example, the individual performance, the employers might have prejudice this is uh, about women only being able to work in this kind of uh, arrangements. And finally, the uh, legal and the collective protection uh, in temporary and informal work is missing, uh, if not dismal. Uh, and uh, the, the women are already underrepresented in the labor organizations, uh, uh, either at the <coughs> lower echelons or uh, the uh, management positions. And you can see that uh, the, the higher share in precarious employment is yet another factor that is reducing, that is uh, uh, making the women to be underrepresented in uh, worker organizations and miss many of the benefits this type of organizations uh, might uh, bring uh, to the workers. So, so overall, if I have to reiterate, the problem is that obviously precarious employment is bad for everyone. Uh, there is no uh, uh, doubt about that with some exceptions. Uh, for example, the uh, consultants who are working in the finance industry even have they have flexible arrangements and temporary contracts obviously they are not the ones who are in an underprivileged uh, position but for an average worker or for a person who is <clears throat> relatively uh, have relatively low endowments such as lower education or uh, uh, young or elderly or uh, coming from a, a socioeconomic background that is not very um, highly rewarded in the labor markets uh, being in a non-standard being in a being in a precarious position obviously uh, makes these workers uh, to suffer both from low wages and uh, lack of social security and uh, representation. But the problem is that these uh, outcomes, these negative effects are exacerbated for women because there is an intersection between gender and the temper, uh, sorry, the uh, precarious employment, particularly in societies where we have uh, strict uh, gender roles. So the various dimensions of the risks that are related to the security of the employment, the incomes and the social uh, relations, uh, where we can consider these jobs as precarious, very much intersect with gender. And uh, what we end up is that uh, a, a double level discrimination uh, in the labor market uh, for women, which is something that I would like to pick up in the second part of uh, the seminar by giving some concrete examples from the uh, Turkish case. So thank you for listening uh, for the uh, this first part and hope to see you soon in the second part.